run by SARS, the Special Anti Robbery Support in Lagos. You must have been hearing about NSAS these days. Yeah. And when people are asking, asking for NSAS, I told them, I said, SARS is not new. We used to go to SARS uh, detention centers. But it was one of the places that I was detained in, in addition to eight other detentions, or seven other detentions that I suffered in Nigeria. A lot of torture. At the University of Lagos, also, some of you must have heard. I was also attacked in 1994, a day before I was supposed to graduate by court gangs put together by the University of uh, Lagos authorities and the Nigerian government at that time. Uh, James Dambaba, who used to be commissioner of police, was the one who organized that on behalf of Abacha. He also ended up in detention for a long time because they were the same people who shot Ibu, the former uh, owner of a Guardian newspaper. I'm just telling you these stories so that when they ask you about experience, you know that some of us have better experience than the people who are claiming to be leaders today. I have said this several times that if it comes to experience, the only experience I don't have is the experience of stealing. I don't know how to steal. Uh, I don't have experience in assassination. I don't have any experience in stealing ballot papers, ballot boxes. I don't have any experiences in engaging or sponsoring robbery uh, people. So, well, Nigeria has been in the state of anomie for so long a time now that we cannot continue to be the ones who are called upon to fight when things go bad. And when it is time to share the spoils of office, they will tell us that uh, we have sworn an allegiance to poverty and as a result we cannot be a part of it. It's not as if I'm interested in sharing the spoils of office, but I'm interested in fixing the country called Nigeria. And I know as I'm standing in front of you today, that I'm better qualified, and I mean it, without bragging, than any of the Nigerian leaders that has come throughout the time I've been engaged in this struggle. I mean, I've seen seven presidents come and go. Bozos, Babangida, Chunekon, Abacha, Abubakar Abdul Salam, Olusheh Gwabasanjo the second time, Yaradua, uh, Jonathan and now Buhari, I'm telling you, all of their brain matter combined together is not up to half of some of you sitting in this room today. Take so, it back! So why should we continue to be led by the dumbest amongst us when we have the sharpest people around the world? Your Chancellor, or Vice Chancellor, we met her today, and when we met her, she said, look, Nigeria should consider itself lucky because some of the best students she's ever seen in South Africa are based here in this school. And, uh, you know, sh the students from other schools were feeling bad, but they couldn't say anything while we were saying that. But I told her that it's very sad that the only place that works for a Nigerian is a place outside Nigeria. If you step out of Nigeria today, suddenly, your, you know, your, your, your life starts to shine. And all of the qualities you thought you'd never had start to just explode in different directions. You become a star uh, in other places. But the moment you fly or drive or swim into Nigeria, your star starts to dim right from the airport. And that is the destiny of Nigeria that we must change right now. That there is no reason, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, that Nigeria cannot have a national airport that is better than that of Cape Town. You know, we don't even want to go to Joburg. I traveled yesterday from the international airport, or mischaracterized international airport at Lagos, to this place. Even just putting bulbs that can make you see where you are. You cannot, they can't afford to put bulbs that can light up. I mean, the cheapest bulb, you can just buy it. The ones that don't consume much electricity. It's as if you are walking through darkness, you know, and at every step, somebody wants to extort money from you or harass you. So we got in front of the DSS people, you know, uh, yesterday again, because they have my name on the National Security Watch List. 
And the moment they saw me, they said, please, Mr. Ashwari, we know you are going to record us. I said, yes, I will. <laughs> they said, look, we are not the one who put your name there. It's our guys that put it there. I said, I said to them, you cannot continue to justify doing stupid things or illegal things because your guys sent you to do it. You have to use your brain. Well, because of the recording that I usually do, the man quickly let me pass. And before you knew it, they were taking pictures with us. But it's not all Nigerians that are lucky that way. The airports in Lagos do not have toilets. They installed some about three, four weeks ago, and they had to, as usual, uh, anything they do, they have to launch it, commission it. We went there yesterday, the thing is falling apart already. It's less than a month ago. So I can tell you all the bad stories about Nigeria, but you already know it. Our candidacy is not to repeat what you already know, it's to fix what we know and what we don't know for the future. And it's also to invite all of you, your energy, your intellect, your capacity and your character to fix your country because you are as bad as the leaders who are running your country. The way people take care of you, they look at you, the way they judge you is based on the kind of leadership you have in your country. A brother saw me today as we were walking around in Cape Town and said, you know, we want you to do something about the way they treat Nigerians outside. I'm looking at him and laughing. I was doing something about the way they treat Nigerians inside. You guys are lucky. You know, you have somewhere to go that provides you some kind of dignity. In Nigeria, people are locked down in the place. If you are lucky, a young person, you dress nice, you are in a car, police will stop. It's a crime for a policeman to think that you are prosperous in Nigeria. They call them SARS. You know, they will stop you, they will get you out of the car. And before you know it, if you get shot or killed, just because they believe that if you are driving a nice car, you have scammed somebody. That's Nigeria for you. But the real scammers, the real corrupt criminals in Nigeria, the policemen are protecting them. They are carrying bags for their girlfriends. They are helping them to fetch water. They are standing in front of their houses as the guards. They are following their children to go to school. The real criminals. And who are these criminals? They are people within the political class in Nigeria. And they are the same characters that we're talking about who has been carpet crossing and carpet bagging back and forth in the last two months. But the question we should ask ourselves is this. Are we going to continue like this forever? No. Yes. Take it back. So if you don't want to continue like this forever, you have a chance and you have a choice of a lifetime. And that is to take these guys out of the equation. I say it in a very, very radical way. I'm not apologetic about it because this might be the last time you hear from me. I don't give a damn. These people, we have to throw a Molotov cocktail at the establishment that is destroying Nigeria. We have to take it out and we have to take it down so that we can take our country back from them. What I'm preaching is this, that there has to be a revolution in Nigeria. It's not just a revolution of the mind, it has to be a revolution of the body. We have to take over our streets from those people who have destroyed it for 58 years. We have to take, up, take back the country from the people who made you refugees in other lands. The people who made Nigerians to be going back to Ghana to be Megas and Shushainas. So 20 years after Ghanaians came to Nigeria and they were Shushainas and Megas. And some of them selling for fourth, as we call it for us, with their Jerry calls in those days for those of you who were old enough. We are back sending moi moi to them <laughs> in Ghana. If the Ghanaian embassy required visa to go to Ghana, you will find queues in front of the Ghanaian embassy for Nigerians who are dying to go to Ghana. If you are in doubt about it, look at the way they are treating you here in South Africa. To get a visa to come to South Africa is help. You get to South Africa here the moment they see a Nigerian, it's help. They did it to us. Today, the immigration guy that was standing in front was going, going to print to hotel booking before he can allow. If you presented to him that you booked a hotel, he has to go and look into the hotel and print it out before you allow you in. Until one of, he spent an average of 15 minutes clearing every Nigerian that stood in front of him. You could see the content in his face and countenance. Until one of them came to us and said, 
Why are you people still standing here? We said, well, the guys are attending to us. No, he asked us, are they attending to you? He said, no. He then took us. It took him less than two minutes. If the Europeans came, they don't treat them that way. They don't treat the Indians that way. They don't treat the Chinese that way. I'm sure they don't even treat some other lesser countries that way. Whereas Nigeria of 198 million, the so-called giant of Africa, which is a gigantic failure in Africa, is treated by every nation, small nations will be kicking Nigeria around like soccer to war. They have no respect for us. For us to regain that respect, we have to fix our home first and foremost. If you don't want South African policemen to be killing Nigerians in South Africa, we have to have a government that is not killing Nigerians at home. Because if you are worried about South African police, how about headsmen who say to you that the life of a, of a cow is more important than that of a human being? And the president is saying that there's nothing we can do about it. I was told in Kaduna, uh, in Abuja, four days ago, a former commissioner for education in Kaduna was killed by kidnappers between Abuja and Kaduna. It's just two hours of uh, road uh, travel. The IG told other people who wanted to travel that road that he cannot guarantee their safety. So the only way to now travel for the rich people is to go on the train. So they had to stood, they mean stand in the train. They had to stand in the train, you know, between Abuja and, uh, and, and, and Kaduna. But it's also a matter of time before armed robbers and kidnappers start attacking the trains. Because the trains move at snail speed. They can obstruct that train easily. In fact, I think they shot at it about two months ago. So they're already testing the waters. <laughs> This might sound bizarre to you, but again, the question I ask ourselves or I ask you is, for how long shall we continue like this? And if we don't want to continue like this, it is incumbent upon you and me to rise up and do what is right, not only by our nation, but by our conscience. There are people who have said that maybe if Nigeria breaks up, Nigeria is going to be a better place. I laugh at them in Swahili. You know, if Nigeria breaks up today, Nigeria has to, every portion of Nigeria that is broken up will inherit its own teeth. You know, so you think that if there's no Dua Republic, Bolatinubu will suddenly leave you alone and say, "Okay, well, I'll enjoy." It. <laughs> you know, if there is a Midwestern state, James Ibori is still there. You understand? Or if you go to uh, rivers, or you have a south south, there will be a wiki there, Rotimi Amechi there. You know, if you go to the north, you'll find a Tambua there, Babangida is there. If you go to the mid, uh, you know, the, the north central, eh, you have the Kwara Tif there, Saraki. So everybody will just relocate from Abuja. The oppression will continue. So until we develop citizens who can resist. And if we resist these people, Nigeria will attract not only great Nigerians, it will attract the best of the world. Because trust me, Nigerians are great people. I have no doubt about it. You have demonstrated your greatness all over the world. Our doctors are doing impossible things. Our lawyers are doing great things. Our accountants are doing their best. Even our pastors are known to be some of the best scammers in the world. <laughs> no, I'm not trying to offend them. Uh, I'm just saying that we everything we lay our hands on, <laughs> we do it very well. Like the Vice Chancellor said, you know, she mentioned sometimes she used the word crime. She said Nigerians are very good, whatever they do, even crime, they do it very well. Uh, but on a serious note, we just, you know, I want to come here. Maybe you know, try to teach you what you already know. You know the easiest way to solve a problem, you know, public ethics, accountability, all those things. You know. But the truth is that that is not our problem. Our problem is just a very minus, you know, very minuscule percentage of criminals that have been holding us to ransom. And when a generation of them is done, they will hand us over to their children or their cultures or friends, and we're just there. 
just looking and doing nothing about it. And the few people that try to do something about it, we laugh at them, we, we, we scorn at them. We have no respect for them. Sometimes when you look at even comments made by young people about people who have done something for Nigeria, you weep. You know, people who have never done a thing before will be insulting someone like Wale Shreyinka. They will insult Chino Achebe. They will insult Ghani Fawa and me, Femi Fawa. Anybody that stood for Nigeria, people, they insult them. But the criminals, if you need to see, they have army of supporters. You go to Facebook or Twitter today or Instagram, you know, they will tell you that eh, Saraki is not the only thief now. Yeah. So if you uh, go and find the other thief in your area, they will tell you, eh, you know, let uh, Buhari finish another four years tenure now. So maybe your region just finishes. So you go back to just did his own. But this is the same Buhari that they have repackaged for another 10 days to go to London. And this is how they will be repackaging him until they somehow use him to win the election. And at that time, they might decide to kill him or return him permanently back to London. The reason why they are using Buhari to do this is because they know that they can fool us whenever they can. And I tell you, these politicians are always looking out of the window, thinking, when are these Nigerians going to react? When is, there, when is it that they are going to shut down this, our business of extortion and destruction and decimation? And they wait and wait forever and nobody does anything about it. They get more and more emboldened. That is what we are determined to stop this time around. And that is why I and others decided to form the organization you know as Take It Back. And within a short time, it's been encouraging that it has become a global phenomenon. All across the world, everybody is shouting, Take It Back. And we have been able to go around Nigeria, rounding up our six regional tour of Nigeria, town hall meetings, engagements in Chokoto a few days ago. And immediately we finished, we decided that it's time to go to South Africa because we knew the spirit of South Africans, and I mean Nigeria's base in South Africa, are so strong that it will be a great addition to this struggle to flush these elements out of our political system in Nigeria. That's why we are here today. And we are not going to stop. We won't be tired until these people are completely removed from our system. Until we flush out all these characters who have made it impossible for us to realize our full potential as a nation or as individuals or collectively. Because every time we try to move forward, they put us in reverse gear. And the next set of gear four, reverse gear movement, is restoring Buhari, who they accepted as, has failed completely. Who could not set up a cabinet six months after he was elected the last time? Who, out of three years, has clearly spent almost a year out of Nigeria fixing whatever is wrong with him, with Nigeria's wealth and resources? who has used members of his family and created a cabal to drag Nigeria back. But some wicked people, I don't know how more wicked you can be against yourselves, are saying that what is best for Nigeria in 2019 is a man in an analog state of atrophy. That is where they want to return Nigeria to. And that's what we are saying no to in organizing ourselves the way we are doing today. We have several other events lined up, but this is the only night we will be here in Cape Town. And I am here not to be, you know, too cocky about what to say to you. you know, I don't want to make a presentation that will make you bored. I'm a professor to teach post-colonial Africa history for eight years in New York. And I don't always like <laughs> I don't always like to teach all the time. Sometimes I just want to vent. And this is what I came here to do tonight. And I hope that somehow I'm able to get you angry enough to think about doing something about Nigeria. For those of you who want to come home, you want to call your families. For those of you who want to organize virtually or directly, you have a chance to do it now. Don't come back next year and say that you didn't have an alternative. 
there is clear alternative in the horizon. Uh, a few days ago, we met with other younger presidential aspirants in Abuja, Mogalu, Feladro, Toye, and several other young people. And my chat to them is that, you know, look, a coalition inside this room is not going to make these people go away. You have to own the streets. If you don't own the streets, forget about it. It is what the young people here did in EFF, led by Julius Malema. They took over the streets. They were part of every struggle that was there, you know. When they, when they did the killing in Macar is it Macarena was the, the, the place where they killed the workers. American. They were there. When the students were fighting over school fees, they were there. You know, any form of injustice in the land, they're struggling against it. That is the way to take and own the street back. Not by saying that, well, we have formed a united front. What does that mean? But we form another coalition. There are probably another five million coalitions in Nigeria. It doesn't mean anything. But as there's some grassroots engagement. Grassroots engagement politically in Nigeria means how much money you have to spread through the market women and taxi drivers and the tri driver unions and Okada drivers. It's not grassroots engagement, it's grassroots manipulation. So we want to have something that is real. We don't have money, I'm not going to lie to you, but money is going to be a currency that must fail within the Nigerian political system. Ideas will be found. Plenty of ideas we have. Our ideas are stated clearly in our own agenda, known as Paisa Heat, where we will take security to a new level in Nigeria. We will take you know, uh, power, which is electricity. Without electricity, forget about it. You, we were flying into Cape Town today, and we saw windmills. Joshua drew my attention to it. He said, the problem is that it's powering a whole village. We drove past a shack, the thing we call a jigunle in Nigeria today, and we discovered that in Cape Town here, there are building houses with uh, solar power on rooftops to power those houses for poor people. That is the way countries develop. But in Nigeria, they are looking for how to destroy the sharks and give it to ShopRite, which is a South African company. Uh, that is after MTN is done with you at night, <laughs> ShopRite is waiting for you during the day car. Infrastructure, these are the kind of things you want to have, not the kind of train that is moving between Kaduna and, uh, and, uh, and Abuja. But fast trains that South Africa has taught us, uh, South Africa is supposed to be our junior brother when it comes to how to run things. Well, look at what they did. The World Cup came here. When I came here a few years ago from the airport, I think God said they had this train is better than what you can find in New York. That is how countries progress. The same time South Africa was achieving this feat, Nigeria and the people who said they were doing oil subsidy had just stolen $26 billion. That same amount of money could have done the kind of wonders we are talking about. You have corruption. You know what it is doing to us. The more corrupt you are in Nigeria, the more popular you are, the more likely you are going to win election. There was a politician at the time that I wrote a story about when I was still a Sahara reporter. He said to me, thank you so much for the story you did on me. And thank ESCC for arresting me because now my people want me to go to the Senate. That's how Nigeria is, you know. Uh, we have scores our economy uh, and the restructuring that needs to happen in Nigeria. I am not part of those people who is throwing out around the buzzword restructuring. It's a buzzword for people who are looking for more money or who have lost out of the sharing formula of the national cake. Our restructuring is the type that is about us. And I have said it very clearly. If you are not in power in Nigeria, you cannot restructure Nigeria for yourself. The young people of Nigeria for whom a restructured future is about, must first of all be in the position of authority. You must fight to be elected. Because if Buhari is restructuring Nigeria today, they will not invite you there. It's going to be the Kaaba that will be invited there, their own people, that are already destroying the system. We have healthcare plans, education. Look, look there's no reason why our universities are not like this. You are not likely to find a hall like this in any university in Nigeria. I'm not, I'm not trying to say something bad. You can't find a hall like this at the University of Lagos that is clean like this. The clock is working. You have uh, two projectors hanging down. There's one camera there. 
The air conditioning is working. The wife, you have Wi-Fi? Wow. She's sending you back here. Yes. So, <laughs> I've just been told that uh, we don't have time. Uh, sometimes we have so much to say, there's no time. Sometimes we have much time, and there's not a lot to say. And that's what we're going to do, because we want you to ask questions. And don't forget, we are heading back to Joe Bob tonight. Unfortunately, my agenda is to miss the flight, so that I can stay here tonight. <laughs> so please, uh, thank you so much for, for coming. I see that more people have arrived. Uh, we'll take your questions. It would have been great if all of us actually sat closer to the front so that we can engage more, but I don't want to unseat you from wherever you may be. So we'll take questions, and I'll try my best to answer them so that, uh, because our handlers want to rush us, I mean, rush us out of this space so that we can uh, return back to Joe Bob's tonight. But we'll still be in South Africa until Tuesday. There are a bunch of events uh, lined up, and uh, town hall meetings are happening, so if you can find your way to Joba in just two hours flight from here, we'll continue from there. Thank you so much for being here. And when we say take it back, you say show them the way. Take it back. Show them the way. Take it back. Take it back. Show them the way. There we go. Thank you so much. Um, thank you guys so much for listening to Show and speech. Uh, we're not going to waste much time. We're going to take questions and recommendations. Uh, but please uh, raise your hands if you're interested so we can push forward. Um, any, any ladies want to ask something, please? <laughs> Um, well, I'm going to start with this. I'm going to take five questions at a time. We don't have much time, so please, uh, we might not be able to reach out to everyone, so please just be able to be if I cannot reach you. Um, if you want to talk, please, uh, please come. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you very much for doing this. I appreciate it. My name is Olawu Fade, I'm a PhD student at the Chemistry Department here. Um, it's a pleasure to meet you, sir. I've been watching your videos on YouTube when, when you went to Kano, Kaduna, and Max. I want to ask you, what do you want to do about the security situation in Nigeria? And about all these old gang of politicians that are corrupt? Because if you eventually do win, these guys will be able to frustrate you one way or the other. So what's your plan for them? And how do you intend to protect them from disrupting things? Thank you. Thank you. Um, good evening. My name is Ibukun. Now, my question is, or recommendation is very simple. You presented typically what every politician presents when we go for campaign. Meaning, they want to do a lot of things. You understand, in a very short time. And my, my concern is, how do you do short things within a limited time of four, eight years? with limited resources. So like I said, it's more like a recommendation. Now, out of these things that you've listed, what is the priority for Nigeria? That's my question, because I know for sure that you cannot do all these things in four, in eight years. So what is the priority for you? Thank you. Okay, my name is Zainab. Uh, I'm studying philosophy, politics, and economics. So, like in the spirit of the Women's Month, I would just like to ask, like, what is the like policy um, plan for like tackling like issues of like targeted towards gender-based violence? Because we know it's like really, really um, um, important and it's prevalent in a country like Nigeria that most things happen in the rural areas where the government don't even get contact with. So, like, what's the plan for a bottom-up approach of development towards gender-based violence? Yeah, good day. Uh, my name is Bayo De Budano. I'm in the uh, electrical engineering department in the city. So I'm here to ask a question. Like, I have like two questions in Google per second. So the thing is, your base is um, largely made of uh, elites, you know. How do you plan to expand to uh, cover the poor people, those people who sell their goods for like 4,000 uh, bucks and uh, bag of rice? So how do you plan to expand your base? 
So I'm just like thinking, you know, because uh, most of them need economic opportunities. So how do you plan to do those kind of economic uh, opportunities that will help them, you know? And second one is um, the country is like uh, being sold, you know, because of uh, we are in debt to like IMF or World Bank and the likes to the West. So how do you plan to end this uh, perpetual debt, you know, uh, like it's ruining the country, like 80% of our revenue is actually going to set this debt. How do you want to end this? this Disgusting system. Thank you for your speech. Uh, my name is Samuel, and I'm a PhD student here. Uh, one of the things you mentioned uh, also pertains to Nigerians that are already doing very well abroad. And the question I want to ask, I hope to go directly to it, is how are you going to make sure that we no longer have brain drain in Nigeria? Because that's a very big problem. Like if you have all the infrastructure over here, there is tendency that you want to stay. But how do you make sure that all those people, the great Nigerians that you've mentioned abroad, that are everywhere, from your experience, also come back home? Thank you. Okay, my name is Abiola Babatunde. I'm a PhD student school of economics here and a lecturer at CPUT. I want I have one recommendation for you and I want uh, just, I want to ask, how, how are you going to, the recommendations, how is you go, because there is poverty in the land, how are you going to do something that what happened in Nikiti by APC winning election through money or PDP will not going to happen in 2019? And lastly, as a Yoruba man, please, I want to prostrate people to <laughs> <laughs> For you because of your courage. I'm a comrade that finished from the University of Lagos. I don't want to run for president in India. This, this guy is laying his down, right? Laying his down for the like strike down for the man. Please, we have to appreciate it. My name is Julia from Stanford University. First of all, I want to appreciate your courage. I want to salute your courage. Then second, what's the plan to infiltrate the House of Reps and the Senate? Because it's not enough to have good intentions, but you need to have people who can um, believe in your vision and reality that are within the House of Reps and the Senate. Thank you. My name is Maria Yakubu. I'm a PhD student in Biological Sciences Department. And um, I have a recommendation and a question type, you know, to the same question. The first question is, what I think the most urgent need that we have in Nigeria is power. And I do believe that if you can do something about power, I believe that that will take care of other problems because there are a lot of attended problems that are tied to this. And then secondly, I feel that uh, an urgent need that we have is to educate people at the grassroots, the common man on the street. Um, these people portend a great danger to us in the sense that however how well meaning you are, but these people do not understand anything other than stomach infrastructure. And for you know, for a little sum of money, they're gonna sell out. So I believe that your presidency should add. Uh, address the education of people at the grassroots. Thank you once again. Uh, my name is Jafaru. I'm a PhD chemical engineer. One question I have for you is that we come from places where we have to see what you've done before before coming here. You mentioned a lot of things about what you did, why you were in Unilag, doing all those stuffs. But we are more practical. What humanitarian projects have you done currently that you think as in, can attract people that are practical enough for us to vote for you? Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Latif, PhD, Master of Electrical. Joseph, could you tell, uh, tell us the name between you and Tinubu? Thank you. The next stop between you and Tinubu. Between 
Thank you, everybody. Uh, my name is Amir Yudushet Munatmas. And I'm an entrepreneur, right? My question is very brief. I want to ask a direct question. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Can you please come out? Um, please, can you come to the front if you are just coming? We want to fill the seats in front. Mr. President, in waiting, uh, I want to ask you, what is the benefit of being a Nigerian? According to your, your travels and experiences, exposure, in your understanding, what is the benefit of being a Nigerian? Thank you. All right, thank you very much, the President of Wittin. I'm Marcus Alan from Stellan Bosch University. And I will, I will send my recommendation and then a question. The recommendation is that you have actually caught the attention of the Nigerian youths, both home, both at home and at work. And then we need to, I think we need to put into consideration the senior citizens. And what I mean by the senior citizens are those the pensioners, the graduates, those are graduates and so on. We can look for what is compared from the part of the country that I want to do. The elders are always very important because of their mass, their, their experience, which is very, very, which is very capital. I would advise that you have to do as you go on the campaign trail, put them in consideration as well. Secondly, I have seen your PowerPoint where you, you, you showed us something about the link between the industry and the business, which is very, very important. I think that is where my experience is it when it comes to use and the development of the country. I would also like to ask you this question. The earth sector is a disarray back in the country. Professional that makes the egg circles a little bit not a good part. So what are your plans to fix this thing? Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Sore, thank you again for coming here to share your plans for the future of Nigeria. I just have one recommendation. Just one. Out of all the agendas you have here, if you can just focus on power, just find some substantiate on what she talked about. It has like a ripple effect on the social economy, agriculture, education, even the security, because with power, more jobs and in turn to reduce um, the rate of people that are going to crime. Just because of power. And that will make Nigeria better. Thank you. I'm just gonna give this um, brother of mine one minute. He just came all the way from standing by to his people, please. Thank you. Okay, I, uh, uh, it's not me alone. We are uh, very many here. We're just coming in from Stellenbosch University. And we know that we have, uh, uh, we have missed a lot in all that you have presented here. But I would just want to pray the Lord. Please, can you just allow two questions from our people from Stellenbosch University? Thank you. He has to fly. 30 seconds per question. His flight is leaving in the next 45 minutes. Please, please consider. So who are the guys from Stellenbosch? Yes, yes. Mr. Shore, I'm um, glad to meet you. you see, I kept you on the ground. I think one of our problems in Nigeria is corruption. And I really want to know how you want to go about it. If we could fight corruption, I believe Nigeria would be good again. Uh, congratulations. Congratulations, congratulations. For awakening the Nigerian youth, I just want to advise you. Okay, my name is uh, Aide Mohamed Usman from Kora State, Nigeria. So, that's why I'm congratulating you for awakening us. But uh, I want to recommend, because I, wouldn't, I have a lot to talk, tell you before because of time, I just want to recommend, sir, that for everything you want to do, you have to, I don't know if you have it anyway, I know when you came to a lawyer I was around, but you should look at the way the politics and the election patterns do go in Nigeria. I can tell you many of the youth the problem we have is that 
when you interact and you have PVC. That is the truth. But there are some people that have the PVC and they are ready. So these are the people that we actually need to orientate so that they will buy into our idea. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I this I promise not to talk more than three hours. Thank you. Uh, I mean, it's amazing. Most of you guys are PhD holders, better qualified than I am. <laughs> and this is why I keep saying there is no reason whatsoever why Nigeria should continue to be in the hands of its dumbest people, where we have the sharpest human beings around the world. And you have asked great questions. And the first question was about security. Uh, I have said it, that the problem with security in Nigeria today is that we don't have a commander-in-chief of the armed forces who is competent and has capacity to run the country. I was one of the people who exposed the chief of army staff at the beginning of the Buhari regimes uh, uh, when they started as having bought houses in Dubai. The man is still there. What do you expect him to do? He will expect the war to continue. When they talk about Boko Haram, do you know why Boko Haram is still festering? Because the general don't want the war to end. Simple. It is the way they are making billions right now. And when Buhari came, you saw how former army generals, all the chief of staff in the army, navy, and air force, they found millions of dollars, some of them in the tank above their house, sewage underneath the ground, under the bed, under cooking pot, inside the pillow. They were money that they stole because they perpetuated the war in Boko Haram. The moment we have a commander she was competent, who is able to give directives, change commanders whenever equip and train properly the Nigerian armed forces, and most importantly, use technology the way it should be used, we will defeat these guys. I have said this. That there are things that a hundred thousand naira drone can do in modern day warfare that five thousand soldiers may not be able to do if they are not properly equipped. But where are we? Nobody's taken along this line. The last time we ever commissioned anything as we usually do, Buhari went and commissioned the same drone that Jonathan commissioned five years before that has never flown before. That tells you the analog nature of our leadership in the country. Whereas technology has afforded us opportunity to do a lot of these things. When Buhari first came and he was using what they call body language, he went to our airport, customs were no longer asking for bribe. Everybody was behaving. The moment they discovered that the body language was fake, they came back ferociously. I remember two months after Buhari came to power, there was no single police checkpoint on my way from Lagos to my hometown, you know, in those days. I came back three months later. I found over 20 checkpoints. Not only do we have police checkpoints, you have custom checkpoints. You have immigration checkpoints inside Nigeria. You know, they are not lying. Then I found on the way NDLA checkpoints inside of Nigeria. It's because everybody sees the Nigerian person as somebody to be extorted and oppressed. When you don't have a commander in chief that is capable, you cannot fight any security problem. But let me tell you, when they want to fight for something that is their own interest, 30,000 policemen suddenly show up in the kitty to help them rig the election. If only we can send 5,000 policemen to go to Zamfara, they will end the killings in Zamfara immediately. Because those guys who are killing in Zamfara, some of them are using cordials, cutlasses, and even crude implements. Our policemen at this still have AK-47. And no matter what you say about Nigerian police, people are still at least generally afraid of the presence of police. We just came from Zamfara. We didn't see one single police checkpoint in those areas. Except where it is convenient and profitable, there will never be checkpoint. Nobody's protecting them. So we need to have Long term, you know, medium term and short term solution to our security problem. There's no big deal about security. You and I knew about it that South Africa is probably the home of insecurity. There was a time it was really bad. But look at where we are today. South Africa at least is doing better than Nigeria. 
much better. Well, right? But Nigeria is just sliding deeper, deeper into oblivion. Second question, you say, how do you frustrate those who might want to curtail your reforms? Well, I have been advised not to give away too much. But one thing I can tell you, and I think this will answer the question about how to fight corruption. Single-handedly, I have, in addition to or in support of, in collaboration with a lot of Nigerians, through Sahara Reporters in the last 12 years that I, I founded some 12 years ago, we've done a lot of fighting against corruption in Nigeria. And you can imagine what I would do, because I know where the monies travel through. I know how they deal with Nigerians when it comes to corruption. There's nobody who knows it better than I do. And to answer one of the questions that somebody asked, what humanitarian job have I done for Nigeria? I have no foundation in Nigeria that can give money to people that the government is supposed to be taking care of because they don't have money. It's actually not the job of citizens to be doing humanitarian jobs. It's the job of government to do social, to provide social security for all. But I'll give you one small single example that happened in my lifetime that you may not forget too quickly. There used to be a woman known as Stella Odua, now in the Senate. She bought two BMWs, inflated price. We exposed that corruption known as uh, Odua Gate. It led to all kinds of inquiries. It was inquiry in the Senate. It's probably the one single story that led to the most outrage within Nigeria. I don't know, maybe because it was BMW and people were jealous of her. I don't know, and I don't care. But do you believe that since Stella Odua was re removed as Minister of Aviation, there has not been a sin, there has not been any major air crash in Nigeria? This was 2013. I did the story. If she hadn't been removed, that story hadn't shaken the aviation sector. I told some of the people who are saying you haven't done anything for Nigeria, so maybe you would have died in an air crash by now. And I'm not bragging about it. It's not as if I have the technical know-how. But there are certain things you do that is even sometimes more than humanitarian if you have conscience and you can object to what is wrong in your own society. Being a humanitarian well giver is not the same thing as being a Robin Hood person who steals from the poor. I mean, you know, they steal from the poor. Yeah. And then they make themselves rich and give it back to the poor. An example is uh, Kwara State. Oh, yes. Um, where Saraki gives rice during Salah. They are going to do it this next Salah again. Yes, they will do it. This Salah, he will double it because he's busy now. Yes, he's busy now. But <laughs> guess what? People see him as a humanitarian giver. But have you ever researched that just in one day, in front of his house, over a hundred women were trampled to death? Any guys ever heard about it? Yeah, sure. It's, oh, it's actually. We, you know, it, on uh, Wikipedia, it is noted as one of the biggest single tragedies that ever happened anywhere in the world. One of it. But people don't remember that. But in, if you go to the lorry today, they will say that he's their savior. Nobody even investigated how many people died. The media was even complicit in covering up this particular, so that there was no body count. And because this most people who died on that day were poor and Muslims, they were buried the same day. So, that is the kind of humanitarian service that our politicians are providing. They will steal from the poor and give back to the poor, and we start saying, oh, he's a philanthropist. When we talk, want to call him, we say he's chief doctor, you know, and all of that jargon that they put after their names in Nigeria. Zenam, you asked about gender-based violence is very, very important, especially from the angle you ask the left. How do we go all the way to the villages where this is happening? And I think this is where also technology can be of help, if government is interested, that we can track where the gender violence is happening. If everybody who is witnessing it, or who has been a victim, can have a place to which they can report. And government can also respond by ensuring that if anybody is in danger, something special is done. Even if it means flying an helicopter to get a person out of the place, that we do it. Because we do it for the rich people. When they have accidents on a highway, we get them flown, not only to the airport, but we fly them out of the country to go and get treatment. 
But this has to be systematic. It has to be that the government or the country recognizes that this is a big problem. And I recognize that because I come from a village, very, very deep village when I was growing up in those states. And I've seen so many of these things happen. But I guarantee you is that with the knowledge of what we know and what we have and what the penetration that the internet has had and even say mobile telephone uh, has done in the country, we can do that. And with the empowerment of our police to be conscious to this kind of violence and to protect and see people who are victims of this kind of violence, a special population of persons that must be attended to, uh, especially of providing special prosecutors that will prosecute people who engage in these things differently from they will handle other types of crimes. It will make it bring about uh, immediate change. By the way, uh, you sell, how do we prevent people from selling their votes? I'll tell you something. Don't let us underrate Nigerians. The same people that are selling their votes now are also the same people who don't use to sell their votes. Some of them in the 80s. You know that there are families that you come from that used to vote for our law, whether he won election or not. Because our law has got some valuable offerings for them. The children will go to school, they provided health care to them. And they did all kinds of things to show that they are able to lift them out of poverty. I am a beneficiary of free education in the southwestern part of Nigeria. If I would not didn't bring a secondary school to my village in 1980, I'll probably be a Hawaiian Tapa today. It's a possibility, you know. But that singular act led to the education of 300 persons in my village. Instead of the six people that used to be admitted to go to secondary school, from another town after they do what they call entrance exams. We didn't have to do any entrance exams. They just brought the college and said to us, there's a new secondary school. And all of us stopped where we just went to the place. We signed our form. We became students. We got teachers. We got books. We got literature books. We got erasers. I joke about it that we got so many erasers. When my cousin got home, she, she thought it was food. She ate up the razor. <laughs> Serious. So that is the kind of thing that people do these days that will make them understand. The question we should ask ourselves is, are politicians actually selling ideas anymore? No. Because when you see them, they just do what they call rallies. Everybody come around, they shout, they throw money at everybody, they stamp it after it, they throw rice at them, and then they throw a few naira and bread, and they disappear. You they win election, before you know it, somebody who used to drive one uh, Jalopy used vehicle before is driving 50 Prado Jeeps. They are surrounded by policemen. The people who voted for them can't even go near them alone. Or in the kitty where they turned out the rounds and a clown held the, 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 the state to ransom and audaciously proclaimed what they called stomach infrastructure. He then built their schools, they built their bridges. They just kind of mix their destiny together and get them to eat, you know? And then everybody was following him around until the better stomach infrastructure, infrastructure practitioners, which are these criminals in the APC, came around and dislodged him. And that's why you see a lot of people, the outrage that would have happened in the kitchen would have been different if it wasn't Fayoshe that was the victim of it. But people just saw it as like, okay, Fayoshe himself came through into office the same way in 2014. You guys have not forgotten about, have forgotten about the Kitty Gate, which we broke on Sahara Reporters uh, in those days. And I'm being warned that there's no much time, but I will try the best I can to just rush through 